Guys, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know we lost Spike in February. He was a great cat, and I love him very much, and Willie and Taylor, we all loved him very much, and it took some time for me to announce it. Strangely enough, we lost Spike in February, but in May, my good buddy had kittens in his house, and all three of them looked like Spike. It's a bizarre coincidence that had nothing to do with Spike, maybe divinely, but not physically, if you know what I mean. And uh, so these three kittens have come into my care because my buddy hasn't been able to come upstate. By a weird set of circumstances, I now have three kittens that look just like Spike. It wasn't planned, but here they are. And they're going to be used in this tips video and maybe future tips videos if they stick around. So that explains the change in talent. We love and miss Spike very much. And thank you all for your condolences and all the people that, that knew about it behind the scenes. So thank you all very much. I want to also introduce you to a new product designed and developed by my buddy Roy Crumrine, who's also on the Welding Tips and Trick podcast with Jody, so I'll put a link down there. You could listen to that as well. This is a great fixture plate. It's thick aluminum. You could use it as a heat sink. It's got a little special spot for your new tungsten and your used tungsten. You could lock products down on here and weld them with precision. In the description below, there'll be a link to a video showing Jody using this very product and demonstrating its, its multiple uses. So if you're interested, take a look in the description for a link to Roy's Instagram. You can ask him about it. Thank you, Roy. Guys, thank you for joining me here on this welding tips video. I have a special treat for you. We have Jody Collier, the world's welding teacher here on YouTube, and JD, also extremely very talented. Together, they're gonna to share their experience with you. Just some common questions that come up and some common solves, and some interesting solves to some common problems. And a little bit of learning. It goes from really high-tech stuff to just simple stuff that I show. So enjoy this video. Most MIG welders are designed like this with this double O-ring design with the uh, openings for the gas ports. And if you don't get this thing completely engaged up in here, you won't get the right kind of gas flowing through here or it's leaking or something. So I'm gonna, you gotta make sure and really push it all the way in there to get it fully engaged all the way. All right, something kind of obvious here, but maybe not so obvious to beginners, is the direction the wire comes off the spool is important. This machine's designed for it to come off the top so that it comes into this feed tube here at a good angle. If, if, you, if you've got it backwards and we're coming in off the bottom, it would put some strain on that and you're gonna wear things out prematurely. It's not gonna feed right. Some machines are designed the other way where it comes under the bottom. You just have to pay attention to that. <laughs> There's another tip. Make sure that's tight until you're ready to loosen it. Otherwise you lose control of that spool. Yep, we'll get this fed through here. You don't want any kinks or anything here. You, if, if you got kinks, snip it off before you feed this in here. I'm gonna feed quite a bit in there before I clamp down the roller on there. Okay, you wanna make sure it's in that groove too. If it's not tracking in the groove, you're not gonna have good feeding. You might get lucky from time to time and hit the trigger and feed it where it feeds all the way through here without catching and birds nesting, but it sure is a good idea to take this off before you do that. You don't wanna to have to start over and undo a bird's nest and have to snip a bunch of wire when all you gotta do is take this off and it feeds right, right out of here. So, there it is. Put the tip back on. You also wanna get this thing bottomed out. Don't just put it in there loose. It also helps to keep it from coming loose to get a little, just tighten it up all the way because that's where your connection is. This is where you get the power to the wire right here. So if it's not in tight, you might not get a consistent uh, transfer of energy or electricity from mm -hmm. the tip to the wire. They call this the contact tip because this is where the contact from elect electricity is made to the to the wire inside there. You know, make sure you want to keep this clean, relatively clean. They don't have to be sterile or anything, but you know you don't want them clogged up with spatter. This particular one has a threaded design. Some of them just slip over, but the, since this is threaded, we want to thread it, bottom it all the way out, and that that gives us a good favorable tip just about flush with the nozzle and so we want to keep our stick out while we're welding to you know just about that long maybe three-eighths of an inch good idea also to snip every time you have to stop within reason really you snip every time not every time but mm -hmm. if I got a big ball on there yeah and I want a good crisp start I'll snip wow. yeah
All right, so this is brass. This is what we use to uh, seal. Brass is a compression fitting, so when it tightens together, it kind of squishes together. You don't need Teflon tape inside on these threads. And uh, feel free to kind of crank on it. That one's good and tight. No leaks. This is a high pressure bottle. High pressure seal when you do it, and you want to open this fully because then it seals again against the top. High pressure gas can leak out past this screw. So whenever you have a high pressure tank, you always want to open it all the way and then try to seal it again at the top. That lets it come all the way out. I never knew that. Yeah. I mean, they say it leaks, but say if you just have this cracked open and you leave it in here all day, that's when you come back and you're like, I didn't even have any leaks. It's coming from up here. Whoa. So. Crazy. Low pressure, like in a settling tank, you don't want to do that, and it's low pressure. It's not going to leak bypass anything up here. That just, the valve, it, it seats down here, and then it seats up there as well. So you want to open that fully. Not your fuels, not your, not a low pressure tank. And the reason why being? Well, you want to be able to shut it off quick. And it's low pressure, it's not going to, you don't have, you shouldn't so, be worried about leaking like that. So in case of a settling, if you have an emergency, you only want it open to half a crack or two. Yep, just enough to get the, just enough to get it to work. And that way you can shut it right back off. Right. Ask me because I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anything can show bubbles. Right now we're good. Should be good. I like to kind of just test everything. No leaks. I'm just going to crack this a little bit and we'll be able to see what you'd be looking for. Baby. Yep. Bubbles leak even work better. You'll get a really tiny leak. It, it call them spider webs. Whenever you do this, I always like to like that one's obvious. Spray it. Walk away for five minutes. You might see one that kind of grows. There it is. See how that's starting to be all these little bubbles? That's a little baby leak. So spray, spray it, it and then check it again in a you know, few five minutes. minutes. Yeah. You want to do that? Like I said, you can crank down on this thing. Do not spray on brass. Just <laughs> We got eighth inch steel that we're gonna try to weld. We're using 025 wire, or where does it say, 025, eighth inch, it's not on there. So we'll go with I9 for 12 gauge, it's pretty close. I9. Yep. So that should get me in the ballpark. As I'm welding, I may adjust that up and down. If I want a little more amperage, I want a little more penetration, I would add wire, would turn the wire speed up, and leave the voltage alone. The profile doesn't look good, then I would start tweaking with the voltage, the A through J. Just a little bit, back and forth. So I'm going to try to MIG weld, but we're hooked up to the wrong bottle. So let's see what that does. Without CO2 and any active gas, we don't get penetration with MIG. It's all sooty. It looks up there on top. Ah, there we go. I was about to break it. Boom. Also, with the cold rolled mill scale, it couldn't even penetrate through that. So, if you're having issues, make sure you're hooked up to the right bottle. CO2 helps this MIG arc bite a bit. Gives it yep. a bit more power. Now that we've got C25 on here, I purged it out so I have a little bit of wire showing. Yeah. Normally you snip this off, but say you don't have your things right with you. I just like to bend the wire over. It'll start right here and then this will just pop right off. A little too much. <laughs> it did give a good shark, though. The thing that guy just pops right off. Yep. It just pops right off, and if you didn't have your pliers, it kind of works. Perfect. And it works well for that oxidation right there on the tip. That's not going to start well. It wants to, when you light up on this, it'll. that's when it pushes your work piece across the table because it can't, the electricity won't go through this oxidation right there. So, so push sometimes. Out, just push it out and bend it over. Smash it like that, it'll start. No kidding. Mm hmm. Wow. And when you're welding and the tip's red hot, you don't have to worry about sitting there and snipping it. It'll start, it'll light right back up. You can get right back into it while that thing's still hot. You let it dry and oxidize like that, that's when you need to do something about it.
There you go. All right, so the biggest things with 110 machines, you gotta have your input power correct. You don't wanna run it off a uh, 14 gauge drop cord. Get a nice 12 gauge heavy wire. 10 gauge is even better. Um, you wanna have it off a dedicated cir circuit. 20 amps is what this machine wants. If you're running in it and you got your lights on the same circuit and you're trying to run it off an outlet over there, you're gonna trip it. If it's got 20 amps, this machine's running really well. That's the, they're designed to run off that full 20 amps. So if you're having issues with not having a hot enough weld or stuttering and stuff, check to make sure you're on the correct input power. And what I found with 110 machines, so short circuit MIG welding, you're literally contacting the wire, then the electricity blows the wire apart. I mean, it short circuits and blows apart and that deposits the weld metal. It's just over and over and over. So if you're trying to blow a piece of metal apart, thinner is better. It takes less power. So if we're running this off 110, we have less power. I tend to find that 025 works a lot better than 035. It's just a, and it doesn't, what was that, 10 thousandths? Hundreds, 10 thousandths? Yeah. That is a big difference in wire. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to run power through it, like I said, we're trying to use electricity to blow this apart. Right. It's easier to blow apart something that's smaller. Right. You don't want to use an extension cord if you don't have to. But if you do, you need to use the heaviest one you can possible. Like I said, I got a big 10 gauge if I got to run 100 foot, 12 gauge for a 50 foot, and then the machine runs fine off of that. But if I'm running 150 foot, I'm going to see some, some, some drop in power for sure. So most short circuit MIG uses 7525 gas, also called C25. That means 75% argon, 25% CO2. Our straight argon just won't work very well at all. You can also use 100% CO2, a little bit cheaper, but a little bit narrow range of operating parameters. Works fine for a lot of stuff. This is why we say C25 is just shorter. C100 is 100% CO2. You can use it, burns hotter, a lot more spatter, cheaper, it's an option. C25 is both for mid welding, but they have different settings and different parameters. That's why they have them in here different. Whenever you buy a welder, it typically comes with a set of regulators, and the regulators always have this plastic lens that dials into the stamped metal. It almost always falls out and gets lost. The first thing I do when I get these regulators home is I wrap them with tape. It keeps the glass lens in place. I'm telling you, you're going to lose it. <laughs> <laughs> MIG wire. This is what comes with the machine. It comes in a little spool. Copper coated steel. This is for MIG welding. We want to swap it over to dual shield flux core. It's flux core wire meant to be ran with gas, not self-shielded with gas also. Special wire. Now to do that, to use this machine, is the only thing we have to do. Add that wire. It's gas shielded flux core wire. Just taking this one out, fed it through here, the exact same C25 gas for MIG welding. That's it. That's all we changed. That's how you can go to dual shield flux core compared to hard wire. Why would we do this? I like to use hard wire up to about 3 16 Anything 3 16 which is quarter inch, anything quarter inch and up, I like to use dual shield flux core. It seems to be that you get a little bit better uh, weld with less amperage. So this is a small machine, I'm limited to about 200 amps. To get a comparable weld with MIG hard wire, to, to get it you need a lot more amperage, maybe 250. Well this machine can't do it. So I can get kind of a 250 amp machine smaller wire. It's not putting down quite as much metal, but it's putting down a big hot weld and I like it. Right. No scientist, but whatever. All right, whether you're doing dual shield flux cores or bare wire MIG, this is no good. You know, all this spatter, eventually it, it accumulates on there and periodically you got to clean it out. They have pliers specifically designed. You know, they call them MIG pliers, they call them whelpers. Doesn't matter, they're the same thing. The easiest way, you know, is just to uh, use these kind of pliers. Some, sometimes the nozzle is big enough where you can do this. But you need to clean it out per periodically because you're not going to get the right gas flow out of there with all that stuff clogging it up. Now, another cool thing about 
about uh, dual shield flux core is you know if you don't have pliers on you you just need to snip the wire it just snaps right off oh wow very cool because it's okay. hollow too basically uh -huh. you always need to clean your material for mig and tig another reason to use dual shield flux core is say you don't have enough time to clean all your stuff this stuff really bites through kind of like a 7018 bites into this mill scale and gets past it another great benefit of it is all position welding so i'm going to weld flat and then i'm going to go vertical and the weld should look pretty much the same so. now just out of question is that because it's cooling with the it's getting cold quicker yes yeah yeah is, is it a fast freeze fast freeze? flux Freezes affects it. how it solidifies so it, it makes it better for all position mm -hmm. okay and then at the top, I'm going to show a MIG weld and show why you can't necessarily use MIG into the vertical position. Ready? Go. One of the best advantages of dual shield is being able to weld in all positions. Flat, vertical, horizontal, and overhead. So we just showed you dual shield to show you how we can weld in all positions. Now we're going to do MIG. We're going to compare it to hardwire. This is flat plate, no prep. This is mill scale. Apples to apples, we're going to do MIG. And then I'll go right back and I'll show a dual shield bead. And we can compare the two. So here we go. Vertical, up. See how crowned it is, how high, and up. Now right here on this side, I'm gonna run some dual shield. It's also much faster. I don't know if you notice how long it took me to do that one compared to this one. Travel speed's faster. See how this bead's flatter? It's got a nice, even convexity to it. It's not ropey and out and barely in there. That almost looks like you'd almost chip this whole weld off the way it's sticking out. This one, it's got the transition that's the way it's supposed to be. I'm lazy and I like to do stuff the easy way. This is easier. It's easy. So this is, a, this is 068. This is self-shielded flux core, but it's just a bigger wire. And this is a good example that you can see the hole that it's a tubular wire and the flux is on the inside flux core and that's what it is okay so flux core wire is used without the gas and it's really meant for situations where it's down and dirt this is self-shielded without gas down and dirty kind of welding uh difficult you know you can lug this machine in there but you don't want to take a big bottle with you the thing weighs a lot you got to strap it up sometimes you can't get in there down in a hole it's good for this mig welding uses gas we use the term gas but this is an inert gas Argon doesn't react with anything. That's why we use it. It can't explode. It can't do any of that. It's noble gas. Doesn't do anything. This shields it. It protects it. Don't worry about this. This gas is no big deal. There's nothing scary about it. So there's only basically like two types of gas if you're going to weld. Let's see the C25 or this. Basically yeah, for basically. any. Basically. There's a hundred different types of gas. Main types of one. Stick, MIG, and TIG. Stainless steel and aluminum. You need C25 and Argon. That's about it. So it's one of those two. Ask yep. your local welding guy which is the one. Yep. And don't worry about it. It's no big deal. The worst thing you can do about it is leave it open and waste it. Then you got to go get another tank. That's the worst thing you can do with it. Argon doesn't react with anything, but it is heavier than air. So if you walk into a whole room with Argon, you get it in there, you can't get it out of your lungs. Just don't drink it. This isn't helium. Don't try to hook up to the tank. Don't get this in your lungs. That's all. You can cut that yeah. hose in half. I can fix it. Yeah. That was on a Sunday, and I'm like... I still have like 10 other hoses. This is your TIG torch. And from time to time, gas wasn't flowing for me personally, and I didn't know why. I could hear it hissing out of the tip of the torch, but I was getting really bad welds. And I realized this was stored in my workshop, pushed up against something, and that had a kink in it. So I was hearing the hiss of the gas coming through, but it wasn't coming through because that was literally kinked. So I just put a bunch of tape on this just to get that kink out. But 
I'm bringing that up just to be aware that sometimes you hear the gas hissing, but it's not getting to the tip of your torch. Make sure you don't have a kink in your hose or that maybe even the stool you're sitting on could be literally on top of your hose. You hear it, but it's not coming and you think you're okay, but you got to double check when you start getting a sooty weld. Why? Thank you. I got all the dumb tips. <laughs> This machine set up for MIG, hardwire. That's what we've been running, 025. Now we're gonna set it up for the spool gun so we can weld aluminum with this 110 volt, 140 MP. We're gonna take this gun out. Now we got the wire in here, so all I'm gonna do, I'm gonna loosen it, pull the gun out, then I snip the wire right here. Now unscrew this little gun. Get the wire out of here because we got to put the spool gun thing all the way up into there. I use this stuff. So I take this out and I keep it around. So I got to paint something. I use this. I'll, I'll throw the wire around it, hang it on something, paint it, then I just snip it. I'm done. So I always end up using this for uh, good little stuff. That's why I just, I don't try to roll it back up into the thing because I use this for all kinds of stuff. Here's the spool gun tip. The thing that's different with this, the wire can't go through it. So we're not passing anything through this except we're getting the power and the gas transferred up. Just like the MIG, you wanna make sure this thing sets all the way up in there, nice and flush. And then we're gonna swap it. We're gonna swap from the gun to the spool gun. Just this one little switch, it lets the machine know what's up. Super easy to do this. Okay. Now we went from uh, C25 back to argon, 100% argon for the spool gun, aluminum. Just like TIG aluminum, just like, yeah, TIG aluminum, argon. When you get low on a spool, it's wound so tightly, sometimes it has a tendency to just kind of pop down in between there. So if you just pop it back up in there, now it'll come out. And aluminum's cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Super soft. That's why we have to use a spool gun. You can't push this from the machine all the way up. It's so soft that it hits anything, it just folds in bird nests. That's why the spool gun is good for uh, aluminum. Little tip with these I like to do, I like to kind of baby that spool inside there. I don't want to sit here and keep going back and forth. You hear it? I, I try to keep it just kind of laying back the way it is, so it's just kind of nice and comfortable in there. That's all. All right, if you have a small shop and you only have a wooden tabletop, I think it's pretty important to put a piece of sheet metal on it. You can get a maybe 16, 14 gauge sheet metal top. And I wouldn't weld directly on this because it will buckle from the heat. Get yourself a drop from your local metal shop, mill, whatever. This will suck in all the heat from your weld and then you just, just get your ground clamp on the sheet metal and you got a workstation. This will protect your wood from all the splatter. This big puck will soak up your heat. And you can work on a station that's safe and won't catch on fire. For TIG welding, you got to have clean metal. Now that means different things for different kinds of metals, but for hot rolled steel, that means removing the mill scale. If you, if you try to TIG weld over hot rolled mill scale, it just looks like Fido's butt. So I'm going to run a little bead here on some cleaned metal, clean down to clean bright metal, and then I'll run a bead on this over the top of this hot rolled that hasn't been cleaned. We should see a, a dramatic difference. See this one, this one's smooth like it should be. And this one's full of voids and pockets and undercut and everything else that could go wrong. 
Now typically if you didn't know to clean this, you would assume you just didn't know what you were doing. And A, you didn't, but B, you, you, your physicality might have been right, but your material was bad. Yeah, you can use the best technique in the world on uh, over hot rolled mill scale, and it's just not going to come out good. You can't you can't put quality into the weld if it's just uh, if you got the hot rolled mill scale on there. No matter how good you are, you, can, you know, a good welder can make something look pretty good. Somebody made this; it looked pretty good without cleaning it, but it would have looked a lot better if they had cleaned it. All right, that's probably living off of the two clean open edges. Right. Most TIG welders have a post flow feature, and that's the, how long the gas continues to flow after you terminate the arc. And you need to get in the habit of holding the torch still after you stop and not whipping it off of there because you're not done yet. You have to shield that area, that end of the weld, especially if you're going to restart there and keep welding. You're going to get a lot better restart if you, if you uh, shield that end of the weld using the post flow gas. So I'm going to demonstrate that here real quick. I'll do one correctly here, just a really short one. just holding it on there for a good six or seven seconds and it depends it's different for different kinds of metals but see got a nice shiny shiny area here that's going to give me a really good restart there's no oxidation there there we go so you can see this is all gray and dark here uh, that will that will sand off it's probably not a not a real defect However, if I wanted to restart there, it's going to be a crappy restart with all that oxidation. Versus? Yeah, versus right here, I can restart on that, you'll never be able to tell where I restarted. This is just a piece of eighth inch steel. I plasma cut it into this shape flat and then I bent it into this shape. You could certainly cut this on a bandsaw or weld a couple of pieces of scrap together, but it's always nice to have a place to hang your TIG torch. Uh, one of the most difficult things is cable management and by having this always right nearby really helps. You don't necessarily need the plasma table, you just need a bandsaw and some scrap steel. With your tungsten, when it uh, when you really kind of get it good like this, sometimes it's just best to start over and you know start with a nice, a nice clean thing. So uh, I'll grab it back here and try to break it off. Not the best, but it works. Pinch it with some really good pliers. Try to keep it straight up and down, the way it's sitting in here. And then I just strike it against something, and it shears it off right where I want it. That's it. Now, it just kind of got rid of all that stuff. You could, if you got a little bit, you can just kind of grind that off, but sometimes you just gotta, gotta start right over. So, what you don't wanna do is cut it. When you try to cut this and sit here and bump on it, it'll split. It'll break off, but it will split the tungsten all the way down. So then when you start to weld, it'll banana peel on you as you're uh, welding. This is my preferred method of sharpening. I have a belt sander in my shop. I like to sharpen it this way. You can either go Tip down, tip up, a little sideways. Whatever you want to do, you want to make sure you have a backing behind it. I like to do it right here on this wheel or the platen. Do not stick the tungsten through the belt. This can go through here. I can't push this through here. Do that. <laughs> not this. Why do you say that that like? way? <laughs> What color tungsten do we use? I use 2% lanthanated, which is light blue. I use it for everything, AC and DC. I've done quite a bit of testing on it, and there's lots of other good ones. E3 is a good one, laser, seriated. I've just found that for what I do, which is just a mixture of, of aluminum and steel, uh, it works great. I don't have to worry about color coding or keeping up a bunch of different colors or worry about keeping the color coding on there because sometimes I like to sharpen both ends. Like so, this one's off. Yeah. You can only tell from the tip. If you can settle on one, it makes life easy. For me, 2% lanthanated. The baby blue. Yep. The baby blue. Alright, so sometimes I like to cut 
the tungsten in half, sharpen four points. That way I don't have to go back to the grinder as often. Cut it, I always end up just kind of turning it on the side and it'll cut through and then I can break it and then sharpen it from there. All right, there's always a question about welding thick to thin on TIG welding and, you know, how do you do it? This is not an extreme example, but it's 3 8 inch thick plate to 8 inch plate on a lap joint. For steel, it's actually pretty easy because if I've got about 125 amps, I can melt the thick stuff, I can puddle it, and I can just kind of, you know, offset the arc a little bit and let it wash up to the thin. Much easier on steel than on aluminum, so we'll do a little demo of each. All right, I've got the machine set on 125 amps, and all I really need to do here is hold a really tight arc length and uh, maybe offset just a little bit toward the thicker plate. Once again, I'm holding the post flow gas for a while over that end. The arc is probably it's probably pointed in right down here. Yep. Doing thick to thin on aluminum becomes much more difficult than on steel. It's so much more thermally conductive, so it's really hard to get the thick piece to melt before you melt the thin piece away. So I'm going to demonstrate here, first doing equal thicknesses, just a really short, really short lap joint, a lap weld, and then here, uh, I'm going to put a little heat on this locally and then immediately get in there to do the job. I like, a, I like a blunt taper with a point on it for a good crisp start on aluminum, especially when I'm making a precision tack weld like I'm tr going to try to do here. It's going to give me a good crisp start. The arc's not going to wander everywhere like it will if it's got a big rounded tip on there. It'll round by itself as I'm welding, but I'm more interested in the, in the crisp start right now. Okay. The arc is still going to want to jump over to this corner, so I'm going to have to make it come down here first. Kind of manipulate the arc a little bit to make sure that both pieces get joined. Let's do it. That was actually somewhat difficult to get that to join because of it really wanting to arc off on that thinner, smaller piece with a corner on it. So I had to really direct the heat to the flat piece. Now, imagine getting something way thicker it's going, to, it's going to multiply the problem, so that's where the preheat comes in. We'll preheat this piece, won't worry about preheating this piece, and then still direct the arc to the thick piece. We should have some success. Without any heat, what's going to happen is this is going to just melt away because it's very difficult to get this melted. So, yeah, so I, you know, anyway. Let's just, let's just do it and see. Yeah, you can see it barely melted the thick here and it, it just melted the heck out of the thin piece because that's where the arc wanted to go. Least resistance. So when you're learning how to TIG weld, the last thing that seems to come along is the skill of feeding the wire with your fingers. And for a little short run, an inch or two, you probably don't even need to. You can just choke back on the wire enough to make the whole run and feed it in without ever feeding it with your fingers. But on longer runs, and especially on aluminum, you just seem to, you feed a lot more wire. It's a good idea to learn and practice learning how to feed the wire with your hand. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways to do it. This is just how I do it. So basically it goes like this. I'm gripping it between lightly, not like with a gorilla grip, between these two fingers. And I feed it that way and then I hold it here by pinching it with my thumb and then I choke back up and feed it again. And the more you do it, 
sitting in a recliner, the more comfortable you get doing it and uh, becomes second nature. Nice. Selecting TIG cups, it, we could, it's a whole hour long video if you want to go into detail, but there's a big difference between stainless and aluminum in the requirements for a TIG cup and argon shielding. Stainless loves a lot of argon. You might use something as big as this. This is a BBW cup. I think it's about a number 18 or something like that. That's this is, Where can you find one of those? Uh, I sell them on my website, oh. wealthmonger.com, oh, but Furek sells them on his website as well. Um, this is a number five, a standard number five collet body cup. No screen, no diffuser. This actually works better on aluminum than this would. Too much gas on aluminum can actually be harmful. And this is uh, a lot of guys, this is their go-to cup for an aluminum. But if you're doing something high-end like Inconel exhaust or titanium, you want something like this. Nice. Yes. What would your stainless welds look like with that? Black. You get something like this if you use a small cup and too much heat on stainless. Whereas if you use a big cup, you might get something like this on stainless. Beautiful. Never knew that till last night. The amount of gas that you need on a cup is basically determined by the size of the cup. So a good rule of thumb, at least what has worked for me, two and a half CFH per cup size. So a number four cup, that would only be 10 CFH. Uh, the, more, the bigger the cup, the more the gas. If you need it, you need it. But if you don't need it, you're just wasting gas. Okay, this is the way everybody else uses a grinder. I like to do it a different way. They do it this way so that the rotation of the blade pulls the grinder away from them if it were to be line. When I do this this way, I'm in line with the grinder. I can't see what I'm cutting and all the sparks are going to come back at me, which I'm not a fan of. Then you got to do something like this. I can't see the line. The way I like to do it is backwards. Get one more click on that. There we go. Now, I like to throw all the sparks away from me. I'm looking back here where this is introduced to the metal and I can actually follow my line a lot easier. Yeah, it could run back up, but I'm introducing it halfway through the blade. Now, if I need to cut from this direction, I flip it over and I'm throwing all the sparks down and away and then I can see where I'm cutting. Everything's going that way. That seems safer to me than the other way. I've started more fires with a grinder, throwing my sparks over there. I'm not watching over there. I've started fires that way. But throw it right here, just like welding. Nothing's gonna burn right here. That wall will burn. I don't wanna throw sparks on it. This is not gonna burn. Maybe the proper way to use a grinder, maybe not. My preferred method. I like the six inch disc because I get the most life out of it and you get the most cutting depth. That's about two inches. Most of the stuff we do is two inch square tubing, two inch angle. I can really kind of, and if it's four inch, you get, this thing just cuts all the way around. This thing cuts nice and quick. This is what, half inch right here? Yeah. Not too bad.